Aloha, and welcome to this presentation of the Vegan Society of Hawaii. We're thrilled today to welcome Dr. Janice Stanger. Dr. Stanger, PhD, is the author of The Perfect Formula Diet. Janice has spent 27 years critically analyzing plant-based nutrition research. Her PhD is in human health and aging from the University of California, San Diego, and is certified in plant-based nutrition through the T. Colin Campbell Foundation. She'll be talking today about dangerous misconceptions about your body. I'd like to give a warm welcome now to Dr. Janice Stanger. Aloha. Thanks a lot, Lorraine. You might be wondering why I'm talking about your body. Why aren't I just talking about food? Because traditionally, when people go to nutrition lectures, all they want to know is what to eat. Well, here's why. I can guarantee you that when my presentation is over, certainly within a day and possibly within hours or even minutes, you're going to come across some expert or someone who calls himself an expert who's going to tell you to do something that's exactly the opposite of what I tell you to do. And you have to be able to evaluate that. And so learning about your body is kind of like learning how to swim if you're floating on a raft. It's great to go floating on a raft in the middle of a deep swimming pool. But if you fall off and then you remember, oh, I don't know how to swim, that's not such a good thing, right? So learning about your body is like knowing how to swim. It gives you the basis to make decisions based on competing advice, just based on what you know about the fundamental laws of chemistry, biology, and physics. Now, you don't have to have a PhD in quantum mechanics or even physiology to know how to do this. Uh, certainly, that's not what my PhD is in. But the uh, fundamentals are actually not that hard to master. And anybody who can read a book can learn the fundamentals. So let's go in and look at what some of those are. So I want to start, although I'm mostly going to be talking about macronutrients today, I want to start with one really very fundamental dangerous misconception, which is the idea that if a little of something is good, then more is better. Actually, the truth is that if a little of something is good, then more is probably toxic excess. And why do I say that? Well, let's get back to how your body works, which is the uh, laws of homeostasis. So your body is always looking to maintain a balanced functioning. It's always looking to maintain all the fundamentals of life, like your body temperature and the amount of calcium in your blood and your acidity versus alkalinity and a million other things within very, very narrow ranges. And they all have to be maintained for it to be survivable. And so it's, it works to do that in a way that has very intricate mechanisms that are, for the most part, beyond your conscious control. You have somewhere between different experts estimate different numbers between 37 trillion and 100 trillion cells in your body. That's just your own body. It doesn't include the microbiome. And so, you know, you have no ability to control what each of those hundred trillion cells or however many there are doing. They have to be able to do it themselves. And that's a lot of work. Luckily, they're up to it or we wouldn't all be sitting here today talking to each other. But they get easily overwhelmed by too much of something as much as too little. So in order to be able to maintain homeostasis and keep you alive and functioning, your body is certainly looking to get enough of what it needs but it doesn't want too much any more than it wants too little. And I think a huge number of our myths about uh, macronutrients and a lot of other nutrients come from this idea that if a little is good, more is better. Just kind of wipe that out of your repertoire of, of things that you believe if you're wanting to understand how your body functions. So let's start getting into the fundamental uh, macronutrients. Those are fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, as you probably know. And we'll start with proteins, which is where there's probably some of the most myths and some of the most dangerous myths. And this is also, you know, obviously related to how homeostasis functions. And so we'll drill down on this. And one aspect of some of these myths is the idea that if you eat something in an animal, particular protein in an animal, say a muscle protein or a collagen protein or something like that, that that builds what 
the analogy would be in your body. So if you eat an animal muscle, it would build human muscle. If you eat animal collagen, that's going to build your collagen. And we're going to have to work our way down a few layers of facts in order to get at why this is a dangerous misconception, why this is just not how your body works and how believing it is um, going to get you into trouble. Because if you believe that, that the proteins and food are the proteins in your body, you're probably going to want to eat lots of them because, you know, everybody wants more muscle and more collagen and all that kind of stuff. So let's start with the fundamentals of what is collagen. And, and as I go through all these various macronutrients at various points, I'm going to try to cut away and get back to fundamentals because that's just how this presentation is structured. So collagens are proteins that take the form of fibers and they're the most abundant protein in humans. And the image you're seeing is actually from the National Institutes of Health and it shows an image of one kind of collagen, which you can see they're kind of rope-like structures that uh, help form things like your cartilage, your bones, your tendons and skin and things like that. They compose about 25% of the proteins in humans. And the idea that people take it or they try to get it from say bone broth or supplements or something like that is that if they eat all this collagen, that's gonna create more collagen in their body and therefore you know, their cartilage will fill back in if they have arthritis or that if their skin is starting to get wrinkled, it'll have more collagen and it'll therefore become unwrinkled and things like that. Well, is there any truth to that? Well, to understand this, we need to really understand what proteins are, because remember, above all, the collagens are a class of proteins. So proteins are basically linked chains. And they're linked chains of amino acids. Amino acids are particular kinds of substances that link together to form all proteins in both plants and animals. And the proteins can range from chains of um, even just a few amino acids up to thousands of amino acids. And when you think of there's 20 kinds of amino acids that form all living beings, and you think of chains of hundreds to thousands, these you can see there can be an almost infinite number of amino acids. And in fact, while you're sitting there right now watching this protein, you might easily have 2 million different kinds of proteins in your body. Or you might have a little bit less, but the point is you're gonna have an awful lot because that's what your body needs to function and maintain homeostasis and keep you going. Because proteins do play a vital role in the structure and functioning of your body. And it's really important to know that the same 20 aminos build plant and animal proteins and that the people who study these proteins are scientists that are engaged in the science of proteomics. You know, people used to just study proteins kind of haphazardly, but there's a whole branch of science now called proteomics that studies these proteins. So, what happens when you eat proteins in food? Well, first in your stomach, the protein chain, and remember this could just have, you know, maybe a dozen amino acids in it or it could have thousands. It starts to be unfolded. Now the unfolding is really important because if the protein chain doesn't have a particular shape, even if the sequence of all the amino acids is perfect, it's not gonna work. Its function is completely based on its shape. So then various enzymes in your stomach start to break down this amino acid chain. And this continues in your small intestines, it breaks it down a lot more. And eventually the goal is that all the protein chains will be broken down into their individual amino acids and absorbed into your body across your um, intestinal wall. Well, sometimes small bits of the protein chains, which are called peptides, don't completely break down, but the vast majority will break down and be absorbed by your body. And then your body uses these amino acids to build its own protein. Now, let's say I, I'm using collagen as an example here, not because it's more important than the others, but because there's so much hype about it out there these days. Uh, Let's say that you had a strand of collagen, like I showed you a picture of, and it got broken down into all its amino acids and it got absorbed into your bloodstream. 
well, what's the likelihood, given all the other proteins that you ate, that your body, when it needs to make a strand of collagen, is just going to pick up, you know, the amino acid that came from the collagen when it could easily just as easily pick up the same amino acid that came from something else you ate, whether it was an animal food or a plant food. Because remember, plants um, are composed of the same 20 amino acids as uh, animals are. And moreover, plants are the ones that make all the essential amino acids. So, you know, it, it's like having a pile of bricks and thinking that if the brick used to be a school and somebody needs to build a firehouse, that they're not going to use those bricks because, gee, it used to be a school and you want to build a firehouse. It doesn't happen that way. Your body sees these different amino acids as pretty much fundamentally interchangeable in terms of which food they came from. And your body can only store fairly small amounts of amino acids. Most people don't know that. But uh, most amino acids that you don't need when people eat too many are converted either to glucose or to fat. So let's get into why is this misconception dangerous, that if you eat collagen, you're going to form more collagen, or you eat more animal muscle, you're going to form more muscle and that kind of thing. You might be able to see that now as just kind of silly, given how your body actually works, but is it actually dangerous? Well, let's think about that, because this kind of misconception, not just this one, but all the similar misconceptions, can you do to make really unwise actions, and those unwise actions can have hazardous consequences like drinking down tons of bone broth. That's not a smart thing to do. And it also might lull you into complacency preventing helpful action. So for example, if somebody has arthritis and they drink a bunch of bone broth, they might say, well, now I don't have to do anything else to you know, help my arthritis when in fact there's lots of other effective things they could be doing to help their arthritis, but they haven't done it because now they've just had bone broth and they think they're done with it. And on a general level, this is true for um, most dangerous misconceptions of which we're only talking about a very small fraction today. And by the way, if you want to know more about protein, I did do a video on protein for the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii several years ago. It's called The Dangerous Truth About Protein. So if you want to learn more about protein, you might want to watch that video later on and it'll get a lot more depth into the protein idea. But I do want to spend a lot of time on some of the other misconceptions because I already, first off, I recorded the protein video, but also because I think people know less or understand less about the conceptions, the dangerous misconceptions that affect carbohydrates and that affect fats or other lipids that are out there and that have the same kind of hazardous consequences. So let's move on to them. And my favorite ones have to do with carbohydrates. And that's the idea that's so widespread among so-called nutrition experts, and even that you'll hear from medical experts and so on, that the main use in your body of carbohydrates is basically for fuel. And that for that purpose, they're not really needed because your body, for the most part, could also burn fat or it could burn certain amino acids and so on. And that's true. So if you think of carbohydrates as nothing but fuel, you're not going to really respect carbohydrates for the absolutely vital nutrient they are and the absolutely completely vital role that they play in your body, which is discounted by almost everyone. So First off, let me go back to the idea of these macronutrients. I don't really like talking about macronutrients because it's kind of simplistic. You eat food and not macronutrients. And I don't want to reinforce the idea that you should be choosing the foods you eat based solely or even mainly on what macronutrients they contain. So for example, lentils aren't the same thing as lollipops. Carrots aren't the same thing as cookies. I think everybody listening knows which ones you're probably better off eating. Fruit is not a brightly colored packet of sugar. 
And it distracts you from the fact and almost blinds you from the fact that carbohydrates have really essential structural and functional roles in your body. So let's start looking at what a few of those are. So here we are going to another fundamental science, which is called the science of glycobiology. Remember with protein, we were looking at the science of proteomics. And now for carbohydrates, we're looking at the science of glycobiology. It's a relatively recent science and it focuses on things like the structure of carbohydrates or evolution throughout you know, the history of life, uh, how they're synthesized, um, and what role they play in, in the bodies of various animals. It's a relatively recent science. Uh, it's much lesser known than the sciences around protein and probably even fats, but it's very fast expanding because it's so important. So carbohydrates are very complex to study. Why? Because they can be linked in much more complex complex ways in amino acids. We talked about proteins being linked chains of amino acids. Well, carbohydrates are linked chains of um, various sugars, and they can be linked together in a lot more ways than the amino acids can. So let's look at a little more depth what they are. Okay, so carbohydrates are an enormous chemical class of substances. Of course, proteins are an enormous chemical class too, but most people don't really think about that. Uh, fundamentally, they're made from carbon, uh, oxygen, and hydrogen. If you're thinking of protein, protein's made from the same substances, but protein also contains amino acid, also contains, sorry, nitrogen, whereas carbohydrates in general would not contain nitrogen. These carbohydrate molecules can take a lot of different forms. They can be chains, they can be straight chains, they can be branch chains, and they can even form rings. And each one, as you can imagine, has a different property in terms of the physical and chemical properties and how it can function in your body. Also, similar to proteins, they can range in size from very small units to very large units. Uh, monosaccharides are also called simple sugars, um, and they're the simplest kind of carbohydrates. And then you get up to what's called polysaccharides, which are the very long chains that can go up to actually thousands of units of these simple sugars structured in very complex ways. And of course, the chemical and physical and biological properties of carbohydrates are going to vary a lot depending on how they're structured. Okay, and, and remember, I'm just telling you the essentials here. If you want to go get a PhD in biochemistry, that's great. You probably had the time of your life doing that, but you don't have to get down to that level in order to understand the role of these foods in your body or why you should respect them and what you should be eating and things like that. So what do carbohydrates do in your body? Well, first off, they do have a critical role in energy and energy storage. As we talked about, that's what most people know about. In terms of energy, usually your body will utilize glucose to immediately produce energy. And if it's storing carbohydrates, it will generally store it as what's called glycogen. Probably most of you have heard of that. And glycogen are, are chains of glucose and the chain gets broken down and it releases glucose slowly and then your body can use it for energy when maybe you haven't eaten for a while or something like that. Uh, glucose is so important that there's a number of hormones that keep it within certain limits in your body. This is one critical aspect of overall body homeostasis for humans. Uh, blood glucose needs to be kept in a certain range, not too high and not too low, or else basically you'll die. Okay, now the carbohydrate units, and this is we're getting into things most people don't know, also often bond to fats. And when they bond to fats, they're called glycolipids. And when they bond to protein, they're called glycoproteins. Both of those, as we'll see, are enormously important in the functioning of your body. And together, these two things, uh, the glycolipids and glycoproteins are known as glycoconjugates. 
Now, one thing I can tell you about people who are in the science of glycobiology is that they're enormously enthusiastic. I don't think when I've started reading their articles and their textbooks that I've ever met any other more enthusiastic scientists. They're just so excited about what they're doing. And they often call carbohydrates a dark matter of the biological universe. It's, it's a critical component that's yet to be understand, understood and appreciated. Uh, they have numerous structural and functional roles in your body, depending how the monosaccharides are linked to each other, what substances they bonded to. It's not an optional nice to have. It's something you absolutely need to stay alive every second of your life. And even uh, the same carbohydrates can have different roles in different parts of your body. The whole science is enormously complex, and maybe that's why it's, it developed so late. So let's look at a quote from one of the glycobiologists on the importance of glycans. Now, glycans are the words that uh, glycobiologists use to talk about carbohydrates. But basically for glycans, what you can just substitute in your own brain, um, carbohydrates or even sugars or sugar units or, or whatever you need to substitute. I know it sounds like any kind of... Um, complex word, but I'm going to use it just to respect the science and hopefully get you more in the mode of respecting the science. Uh, so here's what this researcher says or points out. He says, complex and diverse glycans appear to be ubiquitous to all cells in nature and essential to all life forms. Thus, over 3 billion years of evolution consistently generated organisms that use these molecules for many key biological roles. In this respect, glycans are no different from other major macromolecular building blocks of life, nucleic acids, which would be your genes, uh, proteins and lipids, simply more rapidly evolving and complex. See what I mean about enthusiasm. Okay. So let's get into looking at a vastly oversimplified um, diagram of a cell membrane to start getting you attuned to how important these things are. And, and a lot of it comes back to the, the glycoconjugates. So you can see here that, um, then this is an animal cell, by the way, a, a plant cell membrane would look very different. But what you have is, uh, glycoproteins kind of being all over. And again, they're not shown as all over here because this is very simplified, but in a real cell membrane, they would be all over coding the cell membrane, various kinds of glycoproteins and glycolipids, as well as obviously other, uh, other kind of structures such as various proteins and so on. And, and they're all needed for the cell to work correctly. But also, it's not just on cell membranes that these various uh, glycans are found. They're also found, for example, in the cell nucleus, uh, where your genetic material is. So let's look at some of the functions of these glycans so we can understand more about them and see why there's more and more depth, why they're so important. So what are some of the major glycan roles? And we can't go through them all now, but uh, these are some of the roles that are important in addition to providing energy. So first off, glycans are critical to the operation of the immune system, which involves recognizing the difference between pathogens, which are various things such as a bacteria or viruses or uh, parasites or whatever that could hurt you and your own self, your own cells. This is really important. The immune system is huge. It's a kind of arms race between these pathogens and, and your body and your um, immune system because they're both ever changing. The pathogens are ever evolving as we're all acutely aware of now post COVID. And your body needs to be able to evolve to be able to recognize these. And part of the way it recognizes pathogens is by the pattern of uh, glycoproteins on the surface of the pathogens. And so of course the pathogens are in an arm race. So they're trying to change the pattern of their uh, glycoproteins that are on the, the uh, surface of their cells and the immune system has to race to keep up with all these changes. So that's one reason why glycobiology is so complex. It is 
scientists are sitting there studying it, kind of everything is changing. Uh, fertilization, reproduction, and embryonic development. The fertilized egg cannot develop into a viable fetus with the, the action of glycoconjugates. And then a partial list of some of the other functions. We've got cell-to-cell -cell signaling and interaction of the cell and its matrix, modulation in the functioning of the genome and of many proteins. So again, as I pointed out, these glycans are actually involved in the operation of your genome, your genetic code. Proper protein folding. Remember, we mentioned that if proteins aren't properly folded, they don't work. No matter how many you got of them, no matter if you just sat and ate 16 pounds of meat, if the proteins aren't folded right, they aren't going to work in your body. And the protection of proteins from enzymes, because there's enzymes that are looking to break down proteins and the um, carbs to uh, spare them from that if they're needed. So you can see all this is very complex and that proteins have absolutely no chance of working right. Your genetic code has absolutely no chance of working right without the cooperation of its glycan partners. Now, one place we can see this, I always like to say that the exception proves the rule and I've done that in other presentations that I've done. And here's one case where the exception proves the rule. So one way we can understand the importance of glycans is in the body is by looking at what happens in people that don't have them. So there's certain very rare disorders. Uh, they come from a recessive gene, and that's not from one recessive gene, because there's many kinds of them, but from various recessive genes, which means they only show up in a person luckily if uh, that gene is apart from both parents. So mercifully, these are very rare. But they interfere with the process of forming various glycoproteins, depending which gene is sufficient. And the way that happens is that if the person has this genetic disorder, then they can't produce the enzyme that's needed to form the glycoprotein, or they can't uh, produce the the needed glycan itself, and hence they can't form the glycoprotein. Well, what happens when that complex uh, process doesn't happen? Well, as I said, there's a lot of different kinds of these CDGs. They have a lot of symptoms, which includes abnormalities in fat distribution, blood clotting, immune system functioning, formation of the cerebellum, which is an essential part of the brain, liver and heart disease and seizures, that's only a partial list of some of the symptoms that can develop um, if someone has one of these CDGs. Very often, um, it's very uh, unfortunate, but uh, the fetus doesn't survive pregnancy or the baby only survives if born a very short time. There's really very little in the way of effective treatment for these CDGs. Maybe there will be some time through genetic engineering, maybe we'll be able to uh, give babies that have one of these genetic disorders a proper gene so that they can form the glycoprotein and be okay. But uh, for right now, we really can't. Now, do you have to worry about getting essential glyconutrients in your food? Well, the short answer is no. Now, remember, we talked about the fact there are essential um, amino acids that you have to get in food. There's about eight, some people say nine, whatever the number is, essential amino acids that you have to get in food. And, and nobody disputes that. And we'll see as we go on to fats, there's a couple essential fats that you need to get in food. But the same doesn't really hold true in glyconutrients. And, and here's a quote from another uh, glycobiologist, or I guess a couple of them in this quote. They say humans, with the exception of certain rare CDG patients, biosynthesize a different monosaccharides the body needs from common dietary precursors. So in other words, you don't need to worry specifically about, you know, you only need to eat a certain food. You know, if you don't eat, you know, apricots or, you know, oats or whatever, that you can't make these and you're going to die. That's not going to happen. Your body essentially can synthesize it unless you're lacking one of the essential, 
one of the essential enzymes. And so you can get your glycans from wherever you want, and then your body's going to build what it needs. It's just another example of your body being an incredible factory. So for example, you can just eat very economically. You can eat baked potatoes and brown rice and you know, lentils and whatever else you want, and your body's going to be able to put together what it needs. And remember what your body needs is ever changing because your body's always in an arms race with pathogens. So it's not like there's a fixed set of um, glycoconjugates out there, which is what people have synthesized for hundreds of thousands of years and will until the end of time that doesn't exist. So your body kind of knows what it's doing. And this is one of the reasons, one of the places where you have to kind of let it go and, and do its thing. Now I can't move on to fats before mentioning lectins because there's so many myths out there about lectins. And a lot of people shun some really important healthy foods because they're afraid they contain lectins. And, and again, if you know what lectins are, you can make your decision about whether you're getting good advice from these so-called experts with that too much trouble or input from other people. It's, it's one of the ways to kind of validate the approach that if you understand your body, it's going to help you a lot in terms of making good nutrition decisions. So glycan, sorry, lectins are one of two classes of proteins that bind most frequently to glycan. So remember, glycoproteins are glycans bound to proteins. Well, we looked at the glycans, we didn't really look at the proteins they bind to, and they bind to a lot of different proteins. And one of the classes of proteins they bind to are called lectins. And so plants do contain lectins, which is what you usually hear from people who uh, tell you not to eat lectins because they're telling you to basically eat their supplements instead, but so do animals and so do microorganisms. So the way it works is that the lectins on the surface of one cell will interact with carbohydrates on the surface of another cell, similar to kind of a Velcro setup. So if you're going to eat a lectin-free diet, essentially you're probably going to starve to death. And remember, since lectins are proteins, when you eat them, what happens to proteins when you eat them? Well, we looked at that, they get broken down into amino acids. The, the idea that when you eat a lectin, all of a sudden it gets absorbed unchanged through your intestinal wall and does horrible things to your body, that doesn't happen. It gets broken down like any other protein does. And once the amino acids are absorbed, your body has no idea it came from a lectin or whether it came from a, a leaf of kale. It's just no way to know the difference. Okay, so let's get on to a dangerous misconception uh, that I know all of you are familiar with, which is your body benefits from lots of omega-3 fatty acids. It's like you can't possibly eat enough. You could eat fish all day long and then take fish oil capsules or algae oil capsules or whatever. You just want to eat these things because they're going to make you smart and live forever and all those good things. So let's round this out. Um, we need to start with drilling down on fats, which means drilling down on lipids because fats are a kind of lipid. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the lipids. I'm just putting that out. There's kind of a frame, like a frame around the picture. And then we'll, we'll just talk about the fats from there on in. But I do want you to have the context. So as you might have guessed, there is a new science, not brand new, but a relatively new science that's dedicated to studying lipids in health. So we've got lipidomics, and that rounds out our trio of proteomics, glycobiology, and now we're looking at lipidomics. And you can go online and spend the rest of your life reading about this if you wanted, but you don't need to because you just need to know the essentials. So let's look at a journal article describing lipids. It says, lipids play many essential roles in cellular functions including cellular barriers, membrane matrices, signaling, and energy depots. Cellular lipids are highly complex. That is, there are tens to hundreds of thousands of molecular species. Cellular lipids are also highly dynamic. That is, they are constantly changing with physiological, pathological, and environmental conditions. So again, we need to move back to the idea that your body kind of knows more than you do, and you just need to kind of get out of your body's way because consciously 
the ability of you to understand what's going on through all the trillions of cells in your body and kind of consciously controlling which lipid is doing what and which cell is, is pretty much well below zero. So therefore you need to give your body the right thing and then get out of its way and let it just do what it's, it knows how to do. Okay, so lipids, as we talked about, actually, I didn't mention this before, but they're a group of organic substances, which means they contain carbon that do not dissolve in water. But substances that are only carbon and nothing else but carbon are not lipids. Uh, they're organic substances that have carbon plus some other um, elements in them that don't dissolve in water. And, and even there, they are narrowed down more, but we don't need to go into this because it's not necessary. We're not PhD biochemists here, we're just looking at understanding the essentials. And then fats or fatty acids are a subset of lipids. And that's what we're going to look at here. So basically what fatty acids are is the carbon chain with attached hydrogens. And some of its functions are fuel and energy storage. That's what we know about, right? We know about carbs being fuel and energy storage. Well, now we're finding out fat is fuel and energy storage, but I'm not telling you anything here that you didn't already know. They're also important in cell membrane function and the synthesis of other important substances that you need in your various types of your body. So since fat has so many functions, you can see why your body would want a lot of different types of it. Now, as long as you're getting enough calories, your body can generally make all the fats that it needs. It, remember your body, we talked about as a, as a protein factory, it's a glycan factory. And now you're finding out that your body is a fat factory and can make all kinds of fats for all kinds of uh, purposes as long as you're getting enough calories. However, there are two essential fats that it can't make and that have to come from food, just like there's some essential amino acids, there's some essential fats. And it turns out there's exactly two of them. But before we get into that, let's get to some more basic fatty acid information, because this is going to help you a lot to understand whether you want to be eating large amounts of omega-3s. And, and you purely understand it without some very, very basic biochemistry, which I guarantee every single one of you is, is going to understand in the next few minutes. So we talked about the fatty acids being chains of carbons in terms of their basic structure. Well, a carbon is like a person with four arms or link chains. But instead of having two arms, like we do a left arm and a right arm, they have four arms. So you can think of it as if you imagine yourself being a carbon, imagine you're a carbon atom, you have a left arm and a right arm, but you also have another arm growing out of your back and another arm growing out of your chest. And the basic law uh, about carbon is that every arm, the hand at every arm has to be holding hands with something else. So your, your arm can't just be dangling out there not holding on to something. It has to hold on to something. And you're going to see how important this is. Uh, the fatty acid chains we're concerned about nutrition are usually evenly numbered and are two to 30 uh, carbons long. And then saturation is absolutely critical to understanding of fatty acid. A saturated fat has a maximum number of hydrogens attached to each carbon in the chain, whereas an unsaturated fat lack some hydrogen. So remember, you're um, a carbon atom and you're in a fatty acid chain and you have four arms. So how are you going to be happy? You're going to be happy and you're going to be chemically most stable when your right arm is holding on to the arm of the carbon next to you on your right and your left arm is holding on to the carbon next to you on your left. And then the arms that come out of your chest and your back are holding on to a hydrogen atom. And when you're in that configuration, you're very happy, you're very low energy, you're all relaxed, and it chemically, it's hard for oxygen to destabilize you or other chemicals to destabilize you. And that would be called, if all the carbons in the chain are like that, that's called a saturated fat. If some are lacking hydrogens, that's called an unsaturated fat because they basically have an arm kind of dangling. Now, in order to understand why that's unstable, you'll, you'll understand this immediately just by looking at this little Tinker Toy model I made. That old Tinker Toy kit, you guys probably don't remember that. And I couldn't find a really good simple diagram, so I just made it myself. 
But in this uh, diagram, we've got the yellow being the carbons in the chain, and the reds are special substances at the end of each chain, because at the end of each um, fatty acid chain, there's special substances, which we don't need to be concerned about at all for what we're doing here. And then the blues are the hydrogens. Well, what happened to those poor carbons in the middle? Well, they lost one of their hydrogens, as you can see. So now they have an extra arm that's just kind of dangling there. Well, remember, the laws of chemistry don't really like that. They want all the arms to be holding hands with something else. So in this case, we've got what's called a double bond. You can see in the affected group uh, that the, the carbons, which in a stable configuration would just be holding hands with one another on one chain, actually the hand that's kind of dangling kind of reaches across their body and hold hands with the carbon next to it, which is also lost to hydrogen. And this is called a double bond. And what you're seeing here with the Tinker Toy is actually what happens in your body. When you get to the double bond, you have a kink in the chain, it kind of bends. And you can see just looking at it, it's unstable. If you were to pick up this Tinker Toy and you just wanted to carry in another room, if you didn't carefully support it, where would it break? Well, it would break at the purple double bond because that's not very stable. And again, that's exactly what happens in your body. Those double bonds are very unstable. Which brings me to the subject, finally, of the two essential fatty acids. So what the, that means is that your body can't make them from scratch, and so it needs to get them from food. Now, both these are polyunsaturated 18-carbon um, chains. So there's 18 carbons in the chain with the double bonds, the first double bond specifically placed. And higher animals can't make these essential fatty acids. They take a lot of uh, energy to make because they contain a lot of double bonds and a double bond takes a lot of energy to make because you have to first destabilize a very stable saturated fat bond and then get these things to hold on to each other and maintain their integrity without being destroyed by some other force. So the two kinds you've heard about before, undoubtedly, I'm sure everybody listening has heard about these are the omega-6 uh, fats, uh, fat uh, lino, linoleic acid, which is the omega-6, and then linolenic acid, which is the omega-3. And I've always been mad at the people who name these because they seem so some more. And then one day I suddenly realized that the linoleic acid has eight letters in it and omega-6 is an even number. So that's, they go together. And then linolenic acid has nine letters in it, which is an odd number and omega-3s are an odd number. So now I can remember what they are. So maybe that helps you through reading nutrition books. So what are some of the basics of these essential fatty acids? Well, for one thing, you saw the double bonds in them from the little tinker toy model. So that makes these fats liquid at low temperatures because they're all bent out of shape and they can't really cluster together into a solid like say saturated fats can. And so they're bent at the double bonds so they tend to be liquid at room temperatures. Now the LA, which I'm just gonna use the abbreviations from here on in, which is the omega-6 fatty acid um, is the 18 chain one, is it, uh, has two double bonds and the ALA, which is the 18 chain that has this 18 char carbons in its chain, omega-3 has three double bonds. So you can start seeing they've got a lot of these unstable, uh, very unstable double bonds. Now there's an enzyme that lengthens these chains. So they can go up to and still be omega-3s or omega-6s, but go up to having 20 carbons or even 22 carbons in their chains. And those are essential for certain ones of your body needs. And by the way, no one really worries about the omega-6s because those are easy again for they worry about the omega-3s. So the ones they worry about, the long chain, so to speak, um, omega-3s are EPA, which has 20 carbons and five double bonds, and DHA, which has 22 carbons and fully six double bonds. The odds that one of them is going to get broken at some point is pretty close to 100%. Uh, your omega-6s are a tiny bit more stable. The best known one is arachidonic acid, which is important for your body to build. It has 20 carbons and four double bonds. 
And these are all highly susceptible to oxidation. That is oxygen attacks these double bonds. It breaks some oxygen, makes oxygen happy, makes the carbon chains unhappy because dangerous free radicals form. So that's not a good thing for your body. Your body doesn't want to have more EPA, DHA, or AA than it absolutely needs because it's so chemically unstable. And then when these things get oxidized, they be form free radicals and they can be very dangerous in your body, um, cause a lot of harm in your body. So what are the functions of these long chain fatty acids? Why do you need them at all? Well, DHA is important in the maturation and functioning of the eye and proper functioning of the brain and nervous system, which is why some people think when you eat a lot of them, you get smarter. No, you don't. Um, AA and EPA make certain hormone-like substances that are important in the functioning of your body that help regulate things like blood pressure and clotting and all. So you can see it is essential to have some of these long chains to fulfill the essential functions they have, but that doesn't mean you want tons and thousands of them floating around that you don't need. So how likely are you to be deficient? And this is from a nutrition kind of university level textbook. It says most diets in the United States and Canada meet the minimum essential fatty acid requirement adequately. Historically, deficiencies have developed only in infants and young children who've been fed fat-free milk and low-fat diets, or in hospital clients who've been mistakenly fed formulas that provide no polyunsaturated fatty acids for long periods of time. So if you don't fall in one of those two categories, you're probably not deficient. So what about people who don't eat fish? This is from a journal article. Um, People who don't eat fish or fish products and therefore apparently have limited opportunities to ingest EPA and DHA do not appear to exhibit the symptoms of an omega-3 deficiency. Overt omega-3 deficiency is a rare and extreme condition. So why is this? Um, Dietary DHA, again, this is from a journal article, is not necessarily essential throughout life. It appears that DHA turns over very slowly. Metabolic demands for DHA appear to be very low, especially once tissue pools are sufficient. Indeed, existing metabolic levels of DHA probably represent what is appropriate for normal healthy metabolism. If DHA is not found to be synthesized to any significant degree in the studies conducted so far, Perhaps this is because it's not required in significant amounts for the general population's healthy metabolism and is produced only when required. I don't know why more people don't understand this. Why did they think their bodies, which have been keeping them alive for decades, have no idea what they're doing, but they went and read some article on the internet and now they're convinced their bodies have no idea what they're doing and they have to kind of help them out by giving them toxic excess. Well, probably because they haven't thought about it that way before. Well, hopefully now we'll think about it that way a little bit more. So let's look at the actual results of studies in one area of omega-3 supplement research, which is cardiovascular disease. Uh, in the beginning, most studies of omega-3s and the effect on cardiovascular disease risk were small studies that were not well done or controlled, and they seem to show some limited benefit. But recent large studies and meta-analyses consistently find omega-3 supplements do not improve cardiovascular disease outcomes. And here's a quote from a 2018 JAMA article about this. It says, and, th and this looked at a whole lot of studies have been done to date. All told, fish oil supplements do not reduce the risk of coronary heart disease deaths, non-fatal heart attacks, fatal or non-fatal strokes, Revascularization uh, procedures are all cause mortality among the full study population. Okay, and, and I could go on to cite this kind of evidence, but I'm not for lack of time on the effect of omega-3 supplementation or consuming too many omega-3s on other uh, outcomes. But let's go into some dangers like Let's say there is no danger to eating a lot of omega-3s, either in fish and fish oil or in algae oil supplements or whatever. Then why wouldn't you take it just as kind of like most people think, okay, this is an insurance policy, I'm gonna eat it. Even though there's no evidence showing it's doing me any good. 
Okay, well, for one thing, there's persistent organic pollutants that are found in fish oil supplements, even if their label is purified. They also bioaccumulate in uh, the muscles of fish, which some people eat. Uh, high DHA levels, which you're going to get too much of, may lower arachidonic acid levels in pregnancy, thus impairing fetal growth, because remember, the omega-6s are as important as the omega-3s. And if you kind of uh, impair that balance, which your body's been trying to maintain, then it's not going to have a good outcome, especially in pregnancy. And then high EPA and DHA levels are associated with high-grade prostate tumor risks. That's been known for a long time. Other DHA side effects include nausea, diarrhea, suppressed immune function, and prolonged bleeding. Um, one more word on this before we kind of get into a wrap up is that, you know, people worry, especially about uh, getting omega threes and DHA and so on in pregnancy, because that's when the fetus's brain is developing. However, as you're probably not going to be surprised to learn if you've gotten this far in the presentation, your body knows how to do this. So there are enzymes that turn the 18 chain omega-3s into the longer chain omega-3s that the fetal brain and eye needs. Well, those enzymes naturally increase during pregnancy. So without any supplementation or anything at all, the pregnant woman's body is naturally going to make more of those enzymes and is going to make more DHA and transport them actively to the fetus across the placenta. And therefore the fetus is going to get what it needs, what he or she needs. So let's wrap up with some questions. Um, and one I want to do, because you see this a lot in, out in the literature and you hear people argue about it incessantly, is which macronutrients are most important? Proteins, carbohydrates, or fats? Which are most important in the structure and function of your body? Well, you can probably answer that if you've gotten this far in the presentation. The answer is that this is a really meaningless question and nobody should have asked it. This is like saying which organ is most important in the function of your body. Is your heart more important than your kidneys? Is your liver more important than your skin or your um, lungs? I mean, they're ridiculous questions. If you're going to survive, you need all those. And, and all these organs work together in concert. They all kind of your body's the whole need. You need all these organs and they have to function right. And it, and it makes it do that, makes it happen as long as you're healthy. And it's the same thing with these macronutrients. They all kind of work together. We've seen they kind of form conjugates with each other. They have a lot of very, very, very complex structures and functions that change over time. And if they didn't all cooperate together, um, you know, your body couldn't maintain homeostasis and survive. So I got this next quote from Dr. T. Colin Campbell in his groundbreaking book, Whole, which gives us a guide to a much more informed approach. So here's a quote from Dr. Campbell. He says, when I lecture publicly, I'm often asked about the numbers. Many people want precise formulas and rules. If you're asking these questions right now, here's my answer, relax. Eating the whole food plant-based way eliminates the need to worry about the details. It's just you lots of different plant foods. Your body will do the math for you. That's probably my favorite uh, quote in all of nutrition. And, and the one I tell people most often if they ask me a kind of meaningless question is, hey, you don't have to worry about that. Your body does the math. And it's a good thing because consciously it would be impossible for us to do the math and we'd never get through our first few minutes of life. But luckily, your body knows how to do the math. And if we give it good things, which are whole plant foods, such as veggies, fruits, whole grains, beans, potatoes, nuts, seeds, things like that, then um, and you want to eat a wide variety of those every day as much as possible, then, you know, you're going to be in pretty good shape. So my goal today has been to change how you think of your body. So pretty modest goal, but hopefully I've gotten a start on that. It's a marvelous, intricate system. You need to respect it. You need to work with it. You need to get out of your own way. And that's going to help you maximize your health. And the more you appreciate your body and learn about it, the better position you're going to be in to make good decisions about nutrition and lots of other aspects of life, like exercise and sleep and so on. 
because once you know how you function and the importance of different parts of your body and how they actually work, then you're going to be able to kind of shine off most experts and, and just be able to do the right thing. That was a wonderful presentation, Dr. Stanger, and I, I learned so much from it. I'm going to open it up to questions now. Dr. Stanger, when you go to the internet and want to test for, do you have adequate omega-3s? And you send the blood test in, you get the results, and you see this wide range. And almost invariably, people are going to test too low on the omega-3s. Now, what are they basing their norms on? You know, I don't know what they're bracing their norms on, but the point is that you can only measure circulating omega-3s. It's also like akin to measuring vitamin D, where you can only measure the circulating vitamin D, not the amount that's stored. Most of the omega-3s in your body are going to be encompassed in some kind of structure where they're not going to be measured by a blood test. For example, they're in your brain or they're in your eye or somewhere like that. Maybe if you ate too much of them, they're in your body fat. But you know, I think that it doesn't necessarily matter in a certain sense how many are circulating. What matters is do you have enough for what you need? And if you have enough for what you need and it's already in all the structures you need and those are being maintained and are being protected by, you know, antioxidants that you ate from oxidation because they're all, every single one of them is unstable and prone to oxidation. That's going to give you a much better fix on whether you're in good shape or not. I mean, you probably don't have any um, symptoms of omega-3 deficiency. And so I don't know that eating more and more and more of these highly chemically unstable fats is going to do you any good unless you need it. And I'd be very suspicious of a blood test, number one, because we don't necessarily know the best level or levels. We don't know how that changes over time because different people at different ages and different states of health and different levels of activity and different diets, et cetera, et cetera, might need different levels and so on. So I, to me, it doesn't make any sense. It's nothing I would personally ever get tested unless I had some extremely serious health condition and had run through pretty much every other possible explanation for it. And even then I take it with a big grain of salt if it, if it were my health. That's unfortunate because there are so many vegans who think that because the test says they're not getting enough omega-3s, think a vegan diet is inadequate and they need to uh, add fish oils. So that's, that's really too bad. Yeah, it really is. And some people add the um, algae oils, which at least aren't responsible for the deaths of trillions of fish. But Nonetheless, they're still going to be highly chemically unstable. If you're buying these fats, whether they're algae oils or fish oils, they usually are sold in like dark jars in the back of a refrigerator in the coldest part of the refrigerator to help keep them from oxidizing, but they're still going to get oxidized. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if they don't get oxidized in the jar, they're going to get oxidized once you're in your body because oils can become rancid in your body as well as outside it. Oh. I, I would encourage people not to do unnecessary medical tests of any kind, unless, you know, your doctor tells you to because you have a serious health condition that he or she can't otherwise diagnose. Dr. Stanger, thank you for being such a good sport and coming back and giving this wonderful talk. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you for creating the opportunity to do this. There's something like more than sharing information with people. I just find that so gratifying and fulfilling. So I really appreciate the chance to do that.